in this video here, we're just going to look at the reactions uh, or addition reactions of alkynes. Okay. So the first one we're going to look at is hydrogenation. And by the way, there's going to be a major parallel with chapter six. Uh, we're going to see that a lot of the reactions that or a lot of the things that we added to alkynes back in chapter six were all, sorry. A lot of the things we added to alkenes back in chapter 6, we are going to add to alkynes. Okay, so let's first consider hydrogenation. There's an obvious question about how much hydrogen do you add, because if you look at the hypothetical syn addition product of alkyne hydrogenation, shown here, this uh, cis compound right here, you see that you have a compound that can still accept more hydrogen. In reality, it's very difficult to stop the reaction here under these conditions. One of the things that's hard with working with gases is actually measuring the precise amount of gas that you're delivering to the system. The conventional organic laboratory just doesn't have the apparatus to easily measure the amount of hydrogen that you're putting in the system. Okay? All right. So one of the issues here is that is the catalyst. The catalyst in this case is pretty active and it can hydrogen and it can catalyze the hydrogenation of alkenes and alkynes. Okay, so what we can do is we can switch to a less active catalyst and this is called Lindler's catalyst and most of the reaction equations you see with Lindler's catalyst you're just going to see the word Lindler written. Here's what Lindler's catalyst is, okay? It's a blend of uh, all these ingredients, palladium, calcium carbonate, and lead acetate. Lead is a common catalyst poison. What's happened here with Lindler's catalyst is this catalyst is poisoned, but it's not dead. It's severely weakened, so all it can do it's okay for hydrogenating alkynes, but it's inert in alkene hydrogenation. So therefore, there's no need to measure the amount of hydrogen that you're putting in the system. This reaction will stop at the uh, al at the cis alkene stage. Okay. All right. What if you want to trans alkene? Is there a way to do it? Yeah, but you do not use hydrogenation. You use an alternate reduction. In this case, we're using a dissolving metal reduction. Okay, so when you add sodium or lithium metal to ammonia, you get a beautiful blue solution, which is often referred to as just the uh, solvated electron. Okay, we'll look at the mechanism for that in the next slide. Okay, if you do this reaction, in the presence of ethanol or add ethanol later, what you'll get is the net addition of hydrogen in a trans fashion. So here we now have a trans alkene. Okay, so let's look at some reaction equations involving these. Okay, so all of these have various alkene groups. Hydrogen in Lindler's catalyst, remember, is only going to add hydrogen to the alkyne and it's going to leave the alkene groups alone. So the reaction of this compound, which we'll call a, a dienine because it has two alkenes and one alkyne, is going to provide a triene. Okay, somehow or another, sorry, uh, the double bond is there. It really should still be here. This is a misprint. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so there's no double bond right there. So hydrogen in Lindler's catalyst should produce the compound shown here. Okay, the reduction of this compound below it, again it has an alkene and an alkyne group in it, and in this case what we're going to see is strict reduction or hydrogenation of the alkyne group in a trans fashion. Okay, notice that in all of these reactions the alkene group stays. Okay, nothing happens to it. Nothing happens to it there either. Uh, this reaction occurs strictly at the alkyne group. 
Okay, let's look at the mechanism for this second reduction process. What happens here is that uh, our solvated electron transfers from sodium to the alkyne. Okay, this produces a new species which uh, we'll just refer to as a radical anion. And basically what's happening here with the radical anion is you want to get the radical entity and the carbanion uh, entity as far apart from each other as you possibly can. And that's to put the lone pair and the unpaired electron in a trans fashion. Okay, as you see here in the stoichiometry, it takes two moles of sodium to uh, make this reaction happen. The second mole comes along reacts with the radical part of this radical anion to make the dianion. Okay, and now this gets protonated twice in the location where the lone pair is. And again, the lone pairs are trans, and this eventually ends up giving you the trans alkene. It's important to note here the difference between sodium and ammonia and NaNH2, which we saw and the, uh, some of the earlier parts of this chapter. Sodium, or NaNH2, is a strong base, whereas Na slash NH3 is a reagent for adding an electron to something. They do very different things. Okay, let me just show a mechanistic variant that I've often seen here. Uh, I think this dianion is the, currently the way to go, but... Uh, it's often thought that we can get a proton transfer at this stage. Okay. And then sodium will add its radical here to here to make the uh, anion. So now you have two electrons there, whereas before you just had a single electron. Okay, so this is a mechanism variant that I've seen a lot of times as well. Okay, let's look at some other additions to alkynes. Okay, uh, uh, first let's do a problem. And again, this is a one where you want to pause it and try this problem out yourself. And then restart it. We're just going to look at... Uh, this is a roadmap problem, uh, a little different because the final product of this roadmap has not been drawn. But an important point here is that stereochemistry is important. This is going to be a little bit of a review problem so that you don't forget all of the wonderful, wonderful stuff that's in Chapter 7. All right, so sodium ammonia is going to uh, give us the anionic species. CH3I is going to do an SN2. I'll give you the substituted alkyne, or the internal alkyne from the terminal alkyne. Okay, so we're removing this hydrogen in step one and then adding the methyl group through the SN2 reaction in step two. All right, so this re reagent system here is for doing the trans reduction or uh, hydrogenation. Okay, so this will give you this compound, the definite trans stereochemistry. Now because it's trans and we're adding Br2, remember that this is an anti-addition. And this gives us this, but we have to remember that our bromines added trans Our hydrogens would be where the bromines are not. They were also trans to begin with as well. 
and this of course would be attained as a racemic mixture. You'd also get the compound where the bromine at the top is coming out and the bromine at the bottom is going back. So you'll get its enantiomer as well. On the next slide it's just this, this uh, stuff but presented in a more neat, in a neater fashion and it's the same general idea. I think I actually drew the enantiomer for C but remember you get both of them and if you remember uh, from the exam 3 instructions I told you that if it was a uh, alkene addition producing a single diastereomer. You just had to draw one correct form of that diastereomer. You didn't need to draw both enantiomers. Okay. All right. Let's look at uh, HX addition. All right. So if we add two moles of HX to an alkyne, what we're going to get is a product that has two X groups on the same carbon. This is called a geminal dihalide. Okay. And when we have an internal alkyne that's unsymmetrical, hypothetically, we're going to say that R1 and R2 are different. There's not going to be any selectivity for either of these products in theory. Okay. However, if you start with a terminal alkyne, you do get selectivity and you get completely the Markovnikov orientation. Let's look at the mechanism for this reaction. All right, so we'll say that R is ethyl and uh, X is bromine. We're going to be adding HBr. All right, so when HBr adds to the alkyne, okay, draw the arrows like that. What we get is a carbocation and this carbocation is actually on the same carbon as a double bond. We call this a vinylic cation or a secondary vinylic cation. There are two ways this protonation step can go. You can also make the primary vinylic cation shown down at the bottom. What we know about alkyl group stabilizing carbocation still holds. This ethyl group can hyperconjugate, hydrogen can't, so uh, this is going to be our intermediate. We're going to go by this pathway right here. This is the more stable carbocation. Okay? All right. Bromide is going to attack where the plus charge is, and this is going to give us the uh, vinylic halide. Okay? Vinylic halide is going to react with HBr just like the, uh, all the other alkenes did back in Chapter 6. And uh, it's going to produce this carbocation right here. In this case, there's actually three lone pairs at bromine. So we can write a resonance structure that uh, involves the bromine lone pair here. So this accounts for a little bit of added stabilization of this carbocation. And this also accounts for why the halogens always end up on the same carbon. It's because of this weak resonance stabilization. We'll revisit the importance of this resonance stabilization in Chapter 12. Okay, this type of carbocation, here's the structure here. The vinylic cation is right here. It's not really very stable. This is the uh, geometry. It's less stable than the carbocations you saw before where the uh, carbocation was sp2. This is an sp carbocation. So because you don't produce quite as good a carbocation in the first step, that's why this reaction is hard to stop right here. It's because the second HBr addition step is a little bit easier. There is some mechanistic, mechanistic disagreement here uh, and some people think that uh, this is a, a tri-molecular reaction, two HBrs adding at the same time. Um, but uh, we will just, for this introductory class, that would 
be something more for a graduate physical organic chemistry class to be worried about the mechanistic details here. I think we could see sort of see an intersection of the principles that we established with uh, alkene additions. Okay, let's look at alkyne hydration. This is a very interesting process. Hypothetically, if you add water across an alkyne the same way you did an alkene in the uh, back in chapter six, these are these would be the products, right? All right, so there we are. We added H2O across an alkene or an alkyne. All right, over here, same general idea. So the one on the left is what we call the Markovnikov alkyne hydration product, and the one on the right is what we call the anti-Markovnikov. Now these, this is a type of functional group that we're going to study in a lot of detail much later, actually in the second half of the class. This is called an enol. An enol is just um, an alkene with an OH group. An enol is an unstable class of compounds. This is because it's thermodynamically favorable for an enol to convert to a type of compound known as a ketone. Okay, uh, This is uh, more stable just from a simple bond energy consideration. If you look at a bond energy table that has carbon-oxygen and carbon-carbon double bonds in it, you'll find that the carbon-oxygen double bond has a much higher bond association energy. Okay, so uh, forming a carbon-oxygen double bond is a very, uh, it's often a thermodynamic driving force for many reactions that we'll encounter in the second half of the class. Okay, this interconversion, this equilibrium arrow that I'm showing right here, has a special name, tautomerism. Okay, and tautomerism is just constitutional isomers that are in equilibrium. Recognize that the enol above it and the ketone are indeed constitutional isomers. Turns out that it, uh, this equilibrium fav heavily favors ketone. More than 99.9% of this mixture is ketone at equilibrium. And you can make this reaction or you can interconvert enols and ketones through acid or base. And again, that's a reaction that's going to be discussed in chapter 20. Okay, so what are the conditions for adding water? It's uh, actually, it takes three reagents, water, strong acid, and uh, a mercury salt. It's hypothesized that this reaction was not discovered until someone accidentally broke a thermometer. If you look at just uh, these two conditions up here. Of course, this is very similar to the conditions for adding water across an alkene. So that's what would have been tried first. Some of the other conditions actually require mercury too, if you'll recall from discussions in chapter six. Okay, all right, what's the mechanism? We'll just, uh, uh, sorry, let's just, uh, before we look at the mechanism, let's just look at a few reaction equations. Okay, so if we have a terminal alkyne, this reaction is completely selective for forming the methyl ketone, as you see right here. Okay, so here's a terminal alkyne. Um, we're adding two hydrogens here and water there. H2O is being added to the alkyne to produce this compound. Immediately below it is an unsymmetrical term internal alkyne. And when you use that type of alkyne, you're going to get a mixture of two product types, okay? So in this case here, you note that we're making both the uh, ketone here, okay, and the ketone right here. These two carbons are the original alkyne carbons. And you can add the water with either regiochemistry. Basically, oxygen can 
end up on either one of those carbons. You do get a single product, however, if your internal alkyne is symmetrical, just like it is in the bottom of the uh, the bottom one here. Okay, so here both sides of the alkyne are equal to each other, and you see only one compound. Of course, technically, the C double bond O is on the other side, but that compound would be symmetry equivalent to the compound depicted. Okay, here's the uh, mechanism for alkyne hydration. And I'm going to use mercuric acetate instead of mercuric sulfate. The uh, dianionic nature of a sulfate dianion tends to add a little bit of confusion here. So we're going to use mercuric acetate just like we used with alkene hydration a few weeks ago. All right, so first we're going to complex mercury to the alkyne. And we can have three different forms here. This is widely considered to be the most uh, stable or most representative. This is the mercuronium. Okay. All right. What are these other two? This is the second most stable. And this is the least stable. Okay, so for thinking about where is water going to attack, it's more likely to attack this carbon because there's a partial positive charge character. Let's just assemble a unique compound from these three structures. We're going to see a big partial positive there and a puny partial positive right there. So our water is going to want to attack where there's more positive charge character. Okay, so we're going to add water. We're going to get this protonated alcohol here, a protonated enol. Acetate's going to come by and get rid of that extra hydrogen. Okay, our sulfuric acid is going to protonate this uh, carbon metal bond here to generate the simple enol, and the enol is going to convert to the ketone. Okay? All right, so this is the uh, generally accepted mechanism for alkyne hydration. All right, and when the reaction's over, all you isolate is the ketone. All right, let's look at uh, another reaction. Uh, these are oxidation reactions. We're going to add halogen or ozone to them, just like we did alkenes. All right, so if we add halogen, and the halogen here has to usually be chlorine or bromine, okay, we're going to find that we get predominantly the anti-addition product. And then we're going to add halogen again, and this is going to put four halogens in our molecule. Okay, so we can add one mole or two moles. If we add two moles directly, we would just simply go straight to that product right there. Okay, in this bottom case, we're doing the ozonolysis. The ozonolysis, uh, this simple balanced equation here, okay, transforms the alkyne into this type of compound which uh, we'll revisit in chapter 19, uh, is an anhydride. Okay, an anhydride, as its name implies, it's uh, something that water has been sucked out of. So this is unstable in water. And it transforms to two molecules of a carboxylic acid. So recognize that the same thing that happens in alkenose analysis happens in alkynose analysis. You completely get rid of the multiple bond, but instead of getting a ketone or aldehyde, you get a carboxylic acid. This is the general way you'll see the uh, equation presented. We're going to treat it with ozone, then water, and get two carboxylic acids. 
All right, so let's look right here. And uh, we need to transform the way this is. Okay, so this is one where you should predict the products of the reaction. You should do this yourself. Pause it, then restart it. Okay, so the first one is an alkyne hydration with a terminal alkyne, so we're going to get a methyl ketone. Actually, I, I don't want to write this because this is where the answers are going to be. Sorry about that. Okay, right. Uh, there's the methyl ketone. Let me just write it in a place where nothing is ever going to show up. Okay. Okay, so here's the two alkyne carbons. Here are those same carbons in our product, and we've added two hydrogens and an oxygen, or the net addition of water across the carbon-carbon triple bond. Okay, two moles of HCl reacting with this strained alkyne. Again, sorry, I don't have to write this. We're going to produce this. All right, our first one, recognize, is going to make this compound and it's going to make this and remember that after we protonate This is a slightly better carbocation than having it on the other side. So our chlorines are going to end up on the same carbon. All right, strained alkyne here is uh, we're going to lose the carbon-carbon triple bond completely and form two carboxylic acid groups. The rest of the molecule is going to stay the same because this reagent doesn't touch anything except multiple bonds. All right, and this next one we're going to add one mole of chlorine, then we're going to add bromine. We're going to add any amount of bromine, more than one mole we want to, because this uh, molecule can't accept any more bromine than one more mole. All right, so this is going to produce uh, this compound. Uh, there's actually some interesting stereochemistry, since both additions are anti. Uh, if I ask you to draw the correct stereoisomer, you would have to draw the one shown here and magenta. Okay. All right, so let's uh, look at uh, now some synthesis problems. Okay, outline all reagents needed to form perform the following transformation. Okay, and let's look at some hints here. The product, it's got a longer carbon chain than the starting material. That means that you're going to have to do some sort of carbon-carbon bond forming reaction to make this product. We've really only learned one CC bond formation to date, and that is the reaction of alkynes, terminal alkynes, with base followed by SN2 alkylation. Okay, so you're going to have to use that reaction at some point. Okay. Another important point here, a lot of people make this mistake is, you've never learned any reaction that would directly add carbons to an alkene group. So you know that you have to take this system back to an alkyne at some point. And the last thing to note is that the alkene is clearly a cis alkene. There's, a, again, only one reaction that's ever been taught in this class that makes a cis alkene, and that is the addition of hydrogen to an alkyne group, okay? All right, so let's look at how we would accomplish this objective. All right, so let's... Uh, 
start with how do we make the cis-alkene. We have to take an alkyne and Lindler's catalyst, okay? This is the immediate precursor to the final product. It has to be. We know of no other way to selectively make a cis-alkene at this point. All right. This now gives us an opportunity to use our alkyne alkylation reaction. Okay. All right. So we know that we can make the C. We can make this CC bond very easily by pulling off a proton and then doing an SN2 reaction to introduce the ethyl group. Okay, so the second to last step of our synthesis is going to be taking this terminal alkyne right here, pulling off the proton, And then reacting it with ethyl iodide in an SN2 reaction. All right, so this is what we were in the previous slide, right? So this is what we had figured out we were going to need previously. Okay, I'm at the end of the board here. Sorry. All right, now. How do we make that from uh, an alkene? Remember, this is what uh, this is our given starting material. Remember, earlier in the class, we looked at how you would make an alkyne from an alkene in two steps. You would add the halogen and then do a double elimination, like we see here. So here's the forward synthesis. We would add bromine, do a double E2 reaction to get the alkyne. We would do this SN2-based alkylation reaction. Remember, deprotonate the alkyne, then add the alkyl halide, and then in the final step, we would hydrogenate with Lindler's catalyst. Okay, let's look at another one. Design a synthesis of meso 3 4 dibromohexane using acetylene as a source for every carbon atom. Okay. All right. So, uh, how would we do this? Okay. Recognize that this has two carbons and this is six carbons. So, I'll, logically, they're going to come in uh, two at a time. So, these are going to be our acetylenes. And then, after we finish... Synthesize, designing a synthesis of the MISO, we're going to say how could we change our synthesis in such a way that we would make the DL diastereomer instead. Okay, so let's look at what we do here. All right, recall that uh, the, one, the way we're going to make a 1,2-dibromo system is to add bromine across an alkene. Since bromine is an anti-addition, we're going to need the alkene from this perspective, uh, note that bromine, bromines are, in fact, uh, anti to each other here. So we need the anti-addition to this alkene right here. Okay. How do we make a transalkene? Okay, we know how, that we're going to use the alternate reduction procedure involving sodium and ammonia, uh, then uh, then we're going to have to add ethanol or water or something like that later. Okay. All right. And how do we make this compound from the other compound? Well, we're going to have to do this reaction twice. Okay. First, we're going to use this reaction. Sorry, C2H5CCH, and then we're going to use it again to turn that compound into the product. Okay. Uh, 
says that we've got to use acetylene as a source for every carbon, so that must mean that somehow or another our ethyl bromide has also got to be derived from acetylene. Okay, and how do we do that? Well, we can uh, do the single reduction of the acetylene to the alkene and then add HBr to the alkene. At the final part of the synthesis, how do we change it so that we produce the DL instead of the uh, meso? Okay, all we do is we just change the geometry of our second to last intermediate, the salkene. The transalkene gives meso, the cisalkene is going to also add anti and it's going to, after you turn it around, it's going to add them to the same face. Let's just uh, do that here. And now we have to turn this around to get it in this confirmation, the all, uh, the stretched out or zigzag confirmation where we usually see these molecules drawn. Or that's the way we usually see these molecules drawn. And of course what we do is we change the precursor or the reaction that makes this last compound. We change it from the trans reduction. Now we use instead a cis reduction. Okay, and this gives us the final product. And I believe this is the last slide in chapter uh, 9.